now 7.30 and time to call the meeting of the City of Oak Harbor Planning Commission together uh, May 24, 2016. Uh, let the record show that uh, Commissioners Merriman and Pierce are absent. Uh, at this time, I'd like to have a motion to approve the minutes of the May 10th, 2016. I move that we approve the minutes from the last meeting. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 The next item on the uh, agenda this evening is the uh, public comment portion of our meeting where we accept public comment for items not otherwise on the agenda for the first 15 minutes of the Planning Commission meeting. Uh, seeing no one taking that, I'll close that portion of the meeting. The next item on the agenda is the 2017-2022 Capital Improvement Plan. This is a going to be a public hearing and uh, Steve will Steve Powers will give us uh, direction or comment prior to me opening that uh, public hearing. Thank you Mr. Chairman members of the Planning Commission uh, as you've indicated this is the 2017-2022 capital improvement plan we provided you a briefing at your May 10th meeting only in the meeting format though uh, so this evening is the public hearing on this item. As we've said to you for several months, it's tracking along with the comprehensive plan process. Uh, and when we get to the council, we'll fold them both into the same agenda item. But for, for the purposes of the planning commission, we've kept them separate just because of our timing. So um, maybe we'll go to the PowerPoint here. There we go. So uh, this presentation will look uh, very familiar to you. It's really based on the one that, that we put together for you last time. I won't go through each slide in detail. We gave you, de we gave you background on, on why we do a capital improvement plan, where the requirement comes from, how long we plan for, uh, the fact that it's six years, it's always a, a sliding window forward is how we refer to it, uh, that it's consistent with and implements our comprehensive plan and that we implement it through our budget. Uh, we've talked to you about where do the projects come from. That's a frequent question. Uh, how do we get the projects that are going into the capital improvement plan? Well, the short answer is it comes from those subject matter plans. So street projects come from the transportation plan. Water, water projects come from the water system plan, et cetera. Uh, a little something different this year, we'll, we've incorporated some of the projects from the Windjammer Park integration plan, which we expect to have adopted uh, in June. Uh, projects from that were incorporated as part of our parks projects. This is a graphic representation of what we talked about last, uh, well, a couple weeks ago, uh, that shows you that those subject matter plans inform or provide projects to the CIP. Gave you this graphic as well that kind of give you an idea of the timelines that we're dealing with. As you know, we're, our, we use a 20-year horizon for the comprehensive plan, a six-year horizon for the CIP, and then um, our most detailed look at, at it is in the two-year budgeting process. So uh, these are the revised tables from the ones that we saw you, saw you last time or showed you last time. They're not any bigger this time on the screen than they were <laughs> just a couple of weeks ago, uh, but they have been cleaned up a little bit uh, and they are included in your packet. So for the streets projects, I think the only thing that's really different here um, is that we've eliminated the. Uh, uh, the red text in here and the strike throughs. We also updated the cost of the Northeast 7th Avenue project. That project was still sort of in the, in the conceptual planning stages when it came to the cost estimate. The last one we showed you was 3.6. This one shows you 4.7, but it accounts for the right of way that we believe will be necessary for that project to take place. Uh, so that pushes the numbers in terms of the total expenditures. Um, it also increased our total grants because, again, we're, we're, or we're relying on the RTPO process uh, for grants for that project. 
Um, the only project that's on here that's sort of a continuation is the Whidbey Avenue Crosswalk project. Uh, that project is uh, you know, still something which is funded through the RTPO grant. We've not made much headway on that project. Uh, and so that's one where we've continued to show it on the list for you. Uh, we're showing it in 2017. Parks and Rec, uh, as I indicated before, uh, we've adjusted this based upon the planning effort that we've just gone through with the community on the Windjammer Park integration plan. So it shows uh, phase 1B being done or scheduled for 2018 and phase <coughs> 2 for 2020. The cost from there came, come from the cost estimates that we've received as part of that planning process. We've kept uh, the land acquisition portion of the project list uh, for other parks because, as we know, uh, with a growing community, we have needs for additional park space. That's a long-term process to identify the appropriate spots, go through the process to acquire funding, acquire the property, and begin the park development. Uh, and so that's reflected there. Uh, and then the funding sources, I think, are the same as what we showed you a couple of weeks ago. Uh, wastewater uh, is the same, uh, just cleaned up with this, uh, a little bit. We've got, obviously we're building the clean water facility. That's the heavy hitter project for the next couple of years. Doesn't mean that's the only project that we're tackling, given uh, with, within the context of the available staff resources, we have other sewer line projects that we'd like to tackle. Yes, sir. Uh, just to note that that title uh, of the table is a little confusing, where it says table 4.5 and right below it says table 4.3. Yes, uh, great comment. Thank you for that. I just noticed that as soon as you started to say that. <laughs> uh, water system projects, uh, I went into that fairly detailed last time. The big ones on there are the ones for the bridge hangers uh, and the relocation of the water line um, at the Sharps Corner project. Uh, and so those are are the, the largest cost projects that are on our immediate horizon. Uh, stormwater, uh, you know, we've been reflecting what we know is the Scenic Heights stormwater outfall project that hopefully will be completed this year. Uh, so it no longer shows up in your six year schedule. Right now we do not intend or, or we're not scheduling any additional stormwater capital projects for the next six years. Uh, that doesn't mean we won't do maintenance projects, doesn't mean we won't take care of our facilities, but in terms of meeting our definition for capital project, which is $50,000 or more, um, we don't see any of those on our six-year horizon. General government, uh, we're still reflecting uh, the things that we've shown before, which is the fire station uh, and the animal shelter. Uh, and the marina, while we have a couple of major uh, uh, repair projects down there. Uh, we don't see any of those continuing on into 2017 or beyond. So we have zero projects scheduled right now for Marina. So review process, this is the part of the presentation that is new to you. Um, we've already talked about that adoption of the CIP is, is essentially an amendment to the comprehensive plan. If that's the case, then we use our review criteria from the municipal code for comprehensive plan amendments. It's found at 1815.080. Uh, I've summarized those a little bit here for you. They're in detail in your staff report. In general, we're looking to see, is it promoting the health, safety, and welfare of the community? Is it consistent with comprehensive plan goals and policies? Is it consistent with GMA? Uh, does it address changing circumstances in the community or new policy directions? And is it compatible with the community uh, primarily from a neighborhood and a land use perspective. Uh, as you saw staff's analysis and the staff report, we think the answer to each of those questions is yes. Uh, it is consistent with all of those things. Uh, it is promoting the public health, safety, and welfare. It's obviously consistent with our comprehensive plan, or from our perspective it is, because the projects in there are helping to implement the land use map, so there's that consistency right on down the road. Uh, so we've concluded that it is consistent with all of the appropriate criteria. So our recommendation to you then for this evening is to conduct a public hearing uh, and recommend <coughs> approval to the council. Uh, we've taken the liberty of suggesting a motion for you. If that uh, fits your needs, uh, you can just read it from your packet or read it from the screen, and I'd be happy to help you with any questions you might have. Um, I have one question. Yes. You said Northeast 7th was updated to 4.2? 4.7. 4.7? Yes. It's not on this copy that I have here, or I'm, I'm missing it. It is 
In the one in... <clears throat> it's the same as it was. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I have to say 3.6. I think we didn't get the new... I don't think we got the new... Well, I apologize for that. It should be 4.7. Okay. Um, and, it, and everything else is the same. It pushes... Like I said, it increases the grant amount by a proportionate amount. Um, as obviously, it's been a work in progress. Uh, we must not have gotten the right one into your packet at the right time. Okay. My apologies. I had one other question. Uh, when this process began and they had the public participation uh, events where they, the citizens identified their criteria, the things that they would like to see in the capital improvement project, uh, they were in this document, but they're now generalized under just general maintenance. Uh, the citizens, if they wanted to see, uh, you know, is, is that still part of it? Because they did go through the exercises. So the more detail, and if we're talking about street projects, uh, the, the detail of that is in the transportation plan itself, okay. um, in which we've distilled the information from that, and that's what's providing this project list, and it's also the information that you saw in the transportation element of the comprehensive plan. Um, that document will actually be coming forward to you and to the council within the next month or so. Uh, and so the detail on, on, those, on the, the detailed project list is really included in there. What we're showing here is what we think we can afford to do inside of the, the six-year window. Okay. Yeah, but that's a great question. Thank you. So if we're looking at this table 4.3 where it shows the projects and then the total revenue less the capital, total capital expenditures, there's a, there's a, a balance here of about $964,000. But if we add in that million for 7th Avenue, does that become a negative number? It does not. And, and again, please accept my apologies for, for the error here. We do have the correct one. Um, is part of the presentation. So mm -hmm. if we look over here on the screen, sure. uh, you can see the, the cost at 4.7. Okay. Okay. And then what's happened is on the grants line, because it is our intention to utilize the RTPO grant process, this number here was increased, as was mm -hmm. the other city funds. Those two numbers add up to the 4.7. So we end up with essentially the same um, I don't want to call it excess revenue, but that total is the same. Okay. Because Thank you. because the the while the project costs went up, the revenue costs went up proportionately. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So just for my for my notes, then in that grant line, instead of being three point one three two, what is it? It is. Because I can't read that far. <laughs> yes. Is that four three one three? I I'm sorry. It is four million eighty nine thousand. Is the is what we believe to be the grant portion, and the city funded portion is six hundred and eleven thousand. Steve, is that a percentage that Thank that you. we have to Thank you. pony up? Uh, it's it's eighty seven and a half percent is the is the uh, grant, right. and the rest of it is the That's city match. Fun. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, I'm sorry, 86 and a half. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Any other questions? Mm -mm. Well, we need to open the public hearing, so I will do that at this time. The public hearing's opened. Do I have any comment from the citizens? Seeing no one come to the podium, I will now close the public hearing, and we will do discussion and or entertain a motion. I move the Planning Commission recommend approval of the draft 2017-2022 Capital Improvement Plan to City Council. I second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you for your work. Thank you. The uh, next item uh, uh, this evening is the uh, continuation of the public hearing, the 2016 Comprehensive Plan Update. 
and uh, CAC Kamak will, Senior Planner will lead us through this. Thank you, good evening. Um, so uh, as mentioned, this is a continuation of the public hearing from the last meeting. I had a presentation at the last meeting talking about the three year long process that we followed to get here. Um, so it's been a long, um, long process and, uh, and uh, as Steve mentioned, I'd like to thank the Planning Commission for hanging in there and, and providing us all the uh, feedback and comments and taking public testimony and everything related to the comprehensive plan. It's, an, um, it's a document that's still kind of undergoing some minor changes, no, not much of content. Um, as you know, we provided you with a, a more recent version of it um, uh, yesterday with, that has page numbers and so on. So a couple of things I'd like to point out in terms of what is in this current document that wasn't there when you got the packet last week or at the last meeting. Um, one is the, uh, the chapter 14 on page 195. That's the community coordination chapter and that is a basically a culmination of existing goals and policies that's re re directly related to uh, the community support of NAS Whidbey. <coughs> Since we changed or moved around a lot of information in the other elements, we needed to update that and that's what we did. So there's no real new information in there other than the fact that it's reflecting already um, uh, uh, not, a, not adopted, but already kind of finalized goals in the other chapter. So that's, that's one that's been added. Also want to point out, um, you know, one of the things that we were doing is contacting other agencies for information related to um, their plans and so on. And the school district information was a little um, uh, delayed and we got that information and that's on page 183 and they provided a pretty good write-up on some of the challenges that they're gonna face over the next 20 years trying to accommodate the population. And so that has been added to your latest uh, version as well. Um, as you can see, it's still um, got some minor things that we're continuing to work as we speak. Um, uh, our uh, associate planner, Ray Lindenberg, is, is doing a lot of work on that. Uh, you know, minor things like, you know, giving tables their numbers and figures and numbers, those are the things that we're still continuing to work before the final adoption of City Council. But from content and policy related, nothing's being changed. Uh, that remains the same. Um, one more um, exhibit that was included in your packet that didn't get the latest version similar to the capital improvements plan is the development regulation sheet that talks about the establishment of districts and I have the most up to date. What your copy is missing is the maritime um, land use designation and its related zoning. Somehow that got missed in the, in, when I was creating this. We have the updated version of it. Um, I'll just So not a, not a substantial change, it's just a, something that was omitted. Uh, the maritime uh, is its own land use and so it will have its own zoning. It's a very distinct zoning category that applies to the lands around the marina. So um, just wanted to include that into the text amendment. So that'll uh, move forward to the Planning Commission as, as I've presented it to you. So, um, so thank you again for all the time and I'll be happy to answer any questions, comments, or anything uh, uh, that you have. Um, so I'm here to, uh, I would recommend that the Planning Commission uh, open the public hearing or continue the public hearing, take public testimony if there is, and we recommend closing the hearing. And if the Planning Commission is comfortable making a recommendation to the City Council, we'll, we highly recommend that. Well, it is a continuation of the public hearing. Uh, I, I see no one in the audience that would want to address this uh, matter at this time. Uh, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Once again, count, uh, commissioners, do you have any? Can I ask some questions? Yes. So, so I came into the process very late. You guys had already gone through about 
90% of it, I guess. Um, so bear with me while I ask some stupid questions. Uh, okay. um, so there's still liable to be some changes because, for example, some of this is contingent upon what the county does with their comprehensive plan. Um, most of what the county um, is delaying does not impact us. Most of the information that they will use that impacts us, we have already shared. So for example, one of the main things is uh, population. So we did that a couple years ago. We established the projections and we went forward with that. Um, we did the buildable lands analysis and we did the countywide planning policies which established consistency between all the documents and all the information that they use in terms of UGA expansion. We know that there's capacity so that no lines are moving in that uh, area. So most of the information that we need to share with the county, we have already done that and we have updated our comprehensive plan. Um, I am not entirely sure what they have remaining that will impact us in terms of our update. Um, if they do have anything, um, then it will have to be done through the annual amendment process uh, for the comprehensive plan. Okay, thank you. And then um, uh, getting back to the transportation uh, plan, I understand when we just talked about the uh, capital improvement plan that that's a six year plan, but this is a 20 year plan, but there's still only two items in here as far as the transportation improvements over that 20 years? Um, well, we probably, you know, we have the eight year major update for the comprehensive plan cycle. So even though we plan for 20 years in terms of population projection, our comprehensive plan will get updated every seven years or eight years. And so currently it kind of matches from a project standpoint, the six and seven year capital improvements plan. When we revisit the update, eight years from now, we probably will have a new transportation plan, another update to it, and more projects listed in that, and so we'll, that'll come into, into this plan. Well, I guess my question is the transportation plan, which is being developed right now, is a 20-year plan also? Yeah, um, it plans for 20 years, but it'll get updated every seven or eight years. Yeah, so if, if they're currently doing a 20-year plan, I would think that whatever comes out of that would go in here. Yes. Well, the, the transportation plan is a standalone document and it can stand by itself. What we're doing is taking just the, the policy aspect of it and putting it into the comprehensive plan and calling it the element. And along with that, we're just taking the six year kind of project list and putting it here, which again gets updated every seven, eight years, so. Okay, thank you. I'll go back to the same uh, item we just discussed regarding the transportation plan. And it's my understanding is that there's a number of projects that are out there that uh, are not identified, but because it's a two year cycle, depending on the revenues that are generated, okay, those can move up, okay, even not necessarily in the sequence they were called out initially, but if something more critical happens and needs more attention, those will be moved based on the two-year budget cycle as well? Yes. Okay. So <clears throat> let's say if a project gets moved in year three or four into the capital improvements plan uh, for, f for funding, um, or, or the Northeast Seventh Avenue gets switched out somewhere in the three or four year, we'll be doing plan amendments to right. reflect that. We'll, we'll do a capital improvements plan almost every year. So it'll be in front of us, hopefully, as we know that the changes are occurring, so it'll happen to the capital improvements plan. And if Northeast Seventh is some is a project that gets dropped for whatever reason and some other project comes in, we'll be doing an amendment to the transportation plan or the transportation element here to reflect that changes. So all that change will kind of come through a public process for discussion. Yeah, the seven year uh, the seventh street uh, uh construction project was actually approved several years ago, but we were not able to, uh, we didn't have the, the matching monies to support that, so therefore we had to give the grant money back. That's correct. So that's why it remained on the top of the list of necessary projects that need to be taken care of. And that's why it's the top of the list on this one. 
Yes, it's, a, it's an important project, yeah. much needed project. It meets a lot of criteria for the grants just because it's of its substandard nature and the way it's being used. So we, we feel confident that w when we come through the, go through the grant cycles again, that it will hopefully uh, come up to the top because of uh, all the criteria that meets the safety and all of those standards. Last comment I'll have, if you don't mind. Uh, uh, again, back to the public participation, I just want the public to know that uh, all those projects that, that they spent time addressing, you know, we spent time evaluating as well, and they're all important projects. And each one of those projects has this different things that need to occur, whether it be engineering, you know, it could affect stormwater, uh, wastewater, all of those things. And so there's a lot of different elements that go into it. And it's not as simple as just, okay, putting a stripe on a street and, and having a bike lane or putting a sidewalk in. Things happen underneath the ground that we have to consider as part of these projects that, that do get funded. And so there's a lot of thought that goes into that, you know, uh, you know to move it forward. So I, I just want the public to realize that it's, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that we don't always get involved in and they might not be aware of, but it is part of the project. Yeah, absolutely. I just have a compliment. I really like the formatting of the comp plan. It's really easy to read. It's easy to dive in there and look at specific areas. Um, it just looks really nice. Yeah. It's a big document, so good job. Yeah, we have uh, uh, Ray Lindenberg to thank for. He's pretty creative in that. Um, yeah, who would have guessed three years ago when we started out on this venture and all the little bits and pieces, uh, it, it was all disjointed. We had absolutely probably no clue what it would look like in the end, but marvelous job. Well yeah. done. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Any other comments or concerns, questions? I'm going to make a motion. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Um, I'd like to move that the Planning Commission forward the 2016 Comprehensive Plan major update to City Council with a recommendation for adoption. I have a second. I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 No, it's done. <laughs> we get it. Yes, you appear to be as happy as we are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. At this time, the uh, final item on the agenda this evening is the uh, Steve Powers makes a presentation about the Windjammer Park integration plan. Steve. Thank you, Mr. Wassinger. This is a continuation of our briefing uh, to you uh, on this unique planning effort that we've been engaged on or with for some time. Uh, as you know, uh, <coughs> two of your fellow commissioners are, have been part of our community advisory group and we appreciate their, their participation both there and here. Uh, and what I'm gonna do this evening for you is quickly talk a, a little bit about the feedback that we got at the March open house, and we've talked a little bit about that before, uh, and then really spend the time focusing on what came out of the last CAG meeting, the fifth uh, community advisory group meeting, which was at the beginning of this month. Uh, and then where are we going from here? So uh, this graphic should look pretty familiar to you. We are uh, in the home stretch. We're, we're right down in here. We've had the CAG meeting number five, uh, and we're getting ready to go to the council here, in fact, tomorrow for a briefing at their workshop, and we are um, still targeting June 7th as the date that we go to the council to seek their uh, potential approval of the plan. So. Uh, what did we get in terms of our feedback during that last public participation process? I think you've seen this slide. Uh, we had some good participation at the, uh, on, or at the open house um, with real people. Uh, and then we had a number of participants through the online open house as well. Uh, and uh, got some, some in-person <coughs> surveys turned in and some online surveys turned in. What did we learn through all of that? I think we talked about this before. Family, family friendly things are important. A lot of stuff going on in the plan. Make sure we're getting the right balance. Uh, let's not impact the waterside condos uh, too greatly. Um, kind of some mixed feelings about, about the waterfront trail and, and we have some graphics that will show you how that could look. 
uh, general agreement that we can relocate the RV park in the ball fields. Ball fields particularly are important to note only if um, a, another place is identified and they are constructed before we would remove them from the park facility. Uh, and probably the most obvious statement that any of us will ever make is that the waterfront is a resource and an asset to our community. So this was the plan that was um, shared with the public at that, at that March meeting. Um, this is the plan that is the result of the feedback that we got. You say, well, they're remarkably alike, and, but they are, but there are differences, and I will go through uh, some uh, enlargements, some blow-ups that will show you some of those differences. There we go. So uh, talk a little bit about family friendly. This is just highlighting what we've been doing. Uh, this is down in the southwest corner of the, of the site. So this is where Beeksma Drive comes in to, to entrance the park. Really just some blow-ups that show how those Potential active areas could be organized near the parking uh, so that it's easy for uh, families with children to get into and out of those particular locations. More in the center part of the park, here's the lagoon, the, the, the reshaped lagoon, showing the location of the uh, splash park, which is a key component to just about everybody's thoughts on terms of redesigning the park. Uh, and then, pardon me, on the east side of the park, uh, a much enlarged uh, playground area over the area that we have right now south of the ball fields and so really what this slide is just is just acknowledging that we've gotten that feedback that encourages the the family friendly activities and we're showing where those things in general are taking place certainly not the only places sandy could you please tell me what are you depicting in those little pictures on the far left as you come out of parking, oh, what is so, all of so that? Those are basketball courts. Uh, these would be organized uh, play areas of some sort, maybe bocce ball. Uh, we have picnic facilities in there, uh, areas that you could reserve or rent, just like you do right now for the kitchens. Okay. okay. And so that, and and what we don't want to do is we don't want to dive down too far as to what is this thing versus that thing, right. uh, because as we've been talking about. These, this is at the, the 40,000 foot level. Certainly. And then as we move into this area, there will be additional uh, public engagement mm -hmm. um, and deciding what are the actual features going in those locations. But those are representative things. Thank, thank you, I just you bet. tell what they were representing. Yeah. So um, one, of the, one of the areas which was a little, um, we, had mixed, we had mixed comments on, the, the waterfront trail. Some people like the idea of a serpentine trail with some potential topography. Others like the idea of just the plain straight trail uh, running immediately parallel to the shoreline. Uh, and there was concern that the trail, or the dunes rather, or the, the topography was going to block the view to the water. So a couple of, of sketches here that show really more about what's intended. So as we see, this would be the hard surface trail like this, but then these would be uh, maybe a, a different surface, a more of a, a soft surface trail that would, could take you right up to the water. So different trails for different types of individuals, different mobility levels. Here is more of a drawing that gives you a sense of what that really looks like or could potentially look like with the idea that there is some topography or some terrain, but it's not so high as to block your view of the water. So here we, here we would have the hard surface trail. Here we have some other, surf, other type of surface that could take you to some shelters of some sort. Uh, again, giving you different experiences as the user of the park. So would that be wood planks, perhaps, or with the soft surfaces? It could uh, be. It could be more of a of a soft surface mulch trail. It, when we looked at what the what our landscape architects were calling precedent imagery, we saw a lot of different things. It could be concrete panels with with grasses in between or sand in between. There's a whole wide variety of things. But the idea being is that this would, this would definitely be a continuous hard surface trail, just like the one we have today in, in the sense that, that you have that mobility. Um, and then this um, would, could be a different surface to give you uh, a different experience. So what are some of the things which have changed based upon the public input? Wetlands, we had some questions or concerns that we were showing too much enhanced wetland along the northern boundary of the property. Uh, partly, I think, 
uh, because when we look at what we have out there today, it, it doesn't scream wetland to you, it reads as a drainage ditch. <laughs> but as we've talked about a number of times, it is in fact a regulatory wetland. So whether we view it as a wetland or we view it as a ditch, we have to follow those rules and, and make sure that we respond accordingly. Um, our previous concepts probably showed that enhancement larger than what it certainly needed to be, and maybe larger than what our community was comfortable with. So um, what these are intended to show you is that that area has been scaled back, again, at a conceptual level. We'll meet our requirements for our environmental permitting, um, but we've scaled back on the area of the vegetation, and we've scaled back on the area that potentially is enhanced wetland. Um, in, in recognition of some of the community concerns. Again, please keep in mind that what we've got um, are concept drawings here and obviously not detailed construction drawings. I'm not doing this very well. This is one of the areas which I think is easier for you to see the change in. Uh, lots of comments that perhaps we had too many trees um, in the existing or the previous concept. Uh, we had a heartfelt confession from our landscape architect, which is when they start drawing trees, they really like doing that, and maybe they got a little carried away. Uh, and so what they've done here, this was the previous concept. This is along the northern boundary um, of the park. This is, these are the car dealerships to the north. The, that ditch that we were talking about, I was talking about sort of runs right in this area. So what they've done to show you is, is that they've significantly opened up areas uh, of the park that previously were shown as being in some sort of vegetation or under tree canopy. Would there, would there be any reclamation of those wetlands? Uh, well, in other words, would they, to shrink it up, they have to do other things to, to mitigate that? Well, because it's such a, a, a narrow wetland right now, yeah. we can probably get away from a from a permitting perspective we'll be able to do a fairly narrow enhancement area along there um, okay. <clears throat> it'll be a little different at the at the east end of it where it gets closer to the clean water facility itself that's probably going to bow out a little bit in order for us to meet our permitting requirements in that location but in this area it will probably be relatively narrow uh, in terms of of what that uh, wetland buffer requirement will be so the big takeaway here is that um, there was concern from the community that we would have too many trees that were taking up valuable park space, and there were also some public safety concerns expressed by folks that maybe the understory would provide uh, places for, for activities that we'd rather not encourage in the park. Uh, and so, again, conceptually what we're showing you is an opening up of some of those park vistas. Okay. Uh, we had explored the idea of having a, an additional or a, a relocated vehicular access into the park rather than coming down City Beach as a way to get to parking lot, uh, create a new driveway here along the east edge of the park near the waterside condos. A lot of feedback uh, that that was not maybe the best idea. Uh, and so the revised concept has eliminated, uh, has eliminated that drive entrance, has eliminated the parking here. What we've done is, is, is work to figure out how to create better parking more or less in the city beach street alignment right now. Uh, take better advantage of that space than what is out there today. Uh, we continue to show uh, parking along Bayshore. Other comments we received in here, again, sort of back to the vegetation was that this was too heavily treed um, and that while our waterside condo folks enjoy somewhat of a buffer between the park and them, they still like the idea of being able to view into the park. Um, and so graphically, we're trying to represent that difference. Not a lot of change in here as, as far, I think this is just a blow up to remind us of, of the types of things that we potentially are doing in here with the uh, reallocated parking area, relocating the windmill to have it provide a visual cue as you come down Beeksma Drive. Uh, these two vignettes here are intended to show you that within that larger space, you could, you could use that in a variety of means. You could line it out for ball fields if that's what you needed. Um, and we're still showing that you could potentially um, locate some sort of community room facility uh, in this immediate area consistent with some of those earlier concepts that we looked at. That's obviously not a proposal. It's not a hard and fast part of this. It's merely intended to show you that and show the community that should that be something that the community wants to move forward with, there's a spot that could, could work here and it would be adjacent to parking.
It looks like we've gained more parking stalls. Is it, do we? I don't think there's been a change in the in the size of the parking. Probably that by reducing the tree cover, you can just see more of them. Ah, okay. Yeah. This is a blow up in that in that other corner that where where the, you had the question, Sandy, about what are the types of things that could be taking place down there. Correct. Uh, some precedent imagery. We've we've seen these things before. I'm going to go through these next slides relatively quickly. Uh, here's the area near the lagoon. Uh, it. It actually is smaller footprint than it is today. Uh, we have a reorganized edge, as you can see, uh, hard surface edge. Uh, we've got some ideas as to what that could look like, and then a more natural edge. Um, and this is pretty much the same as what you've seen in previous versions. Some, some more detail about how the area to the south of the clean water facility could look. Uh, you know, the Splash Park is the thing that everybody is, is talking about right now. It's envisioned being at the end of that promenade that comes down from Pioneer Way. A nice visual cue here. Uh, a water feature which originates at the clean water facility would flow down to the, clean, to the Splash Park itself. And again, these are some images of, of similar types of things in other parks, not intended to show you an actual picture of what we're going to build. What, it, what the area of the ball fields could look like uh, when and if we get to the point of relocating them and reclaiming that as, as park area as opposed to uh, dedicated baseball. It's a good point right now for, for quick questions, although you've been asking them all along. Um, the, uh, the two concerns that I have uh, at the last meeting that we had of the uh, CAG, it was stated that the parking to the south of the sewer plant was going to be for the employees there and I don't know if that was just as misspeaking I think it is there, there is employee parking on the inside of the compound for lack of a better phrase uh, there are parking spaces in inside of there okay yeah good because that that's yeah. the closest parking yeah and that's no. going to be handicap parking or something yeah, yeah. yeah. Th that would be parking that would be for the community visitors to the to the center not for staff parking yeah and then my other biggest concern is that the at the very first meetings of the plan for the uh, sewer plant it was talked about that one of the going in propositions was the sight line down city beach street to mount rainier would be kept open and the diagrams don't really indicate that that's still going to happen okay we'll make note of that because i you know I, I don't think there's anything that's intended to be at the end of that that's a, a a vista blocker but we'll make sure that that comment is carried forward as as we look as we get to those phases of the plan thank you good comment thank you uh, that actually takes me into the next phase which i won't spend a lot of time on the next portion of the uh, presentation cost was obviously a, a question that folks had what do these types of things cost so our consultants uh, pulled for us costs from various other urban parks that they have been involved with either designing or in construction or both uh, and, and there's a, a range of, as you might expect, depending upon the circumstances. So we looked at, you know, different size parks, what's the cost per acre, uh, just merely as a benchmark. Obviously, each is going to be different. Each situation is different. So here you're at one place in Portland, it's 450 per acre. Another place uh, in Oregon, it's a little over a million an acre. Obviously, that's a pretty, pretty wide range. Uh, we're back to 450 an acre. Uh, a million an acre, to, again, depending upon the features and the, and the particular challenges of that particular site. Uh, as low as 140 an acre uh, for, for a, a, a much simpler park uh, in Beaverton and about 350 for a park in, in Wilsonville. Um, you can see uh, here's a very urban park, obviously. Uh, given the context and a very urban price, right? <laughs> yeah, Mr. Uh, yeah, boy. So rough, rough level estimates at this point, what they call planning level estimates, with the things that we're, we're showing conceptually somewhere in the range of 630 an acre, which is, which is to the low end of, the, of that range that, that you've just seen. So the, the big question then for folks was, was phasing, and let me just start by saying this is actually fairly complicated, but it's also very simple. Um, the, the complicated portion of it is, is knowing exactly which piece of, on the ground is being disturbed as part of the construction project and, and how will that repair and replacement 
take place and at what point. That's a little more challenging than what we're showing here. This is the phasing that's envisioned or suggested for implementing this particular plan. So you can see that there's been quite a bit of thought gone into this. Um, phase one, phase one B, two, three, four, and five uh, is, is the last piece over here. So in sequence, a little bit easier to see. Um, we've gone through and we've listed the things that we think will take place in one, and this one actually shows one and one B, and then we show one again. So the reason that, that this is one is that, whoops, that was too fast, is that from about this line north, and then over to here are the areas that we are presently disturbing. Right, so that's the area where we have construction, that's where we have the lay down yard for all the equipment and the supplies, that's where we have the giant mound of dirt. <laughs> so obviously we have an obligation to fix all of that area as part of the clean water facility. We're calling that phase one, but essentially it's the, it's the last piece of the construction of the facility. That also includes creating uh, the new parking area, parking lot, which is underneath where the Woodbound Bank, Bank building, the former Woodbound Bank building sits right now. So phase 1B then is that area immediately south of that line down to the waterfront. And most importantly, we think includes the splash park. As you saw from your earlier agenda item, we've included that in the 2018 capital improvement plan. So our, our goal, our intention at this point from a staff perspective is for this to follow essentially almost simultaneously with phase one. Uh, because as you know, we're, we're trying to bring the, the plant online in, in mid-2018. So we're trying to figure out how to make this happen at the same time that all of the rest of this happens. Phase two, uh, whoops, gosh darn it, now I'm going crazy. Phase two gives <laughs> us the, the grand entrance uh, to the park, gives us the improvements along Beeksman Drive, gives us the southern half of that parking area that wasn't part of phase one. Three gives us that, that, that middle area, that open um, grassy area that can be used for a variety of events, plus the improvements down in this lower corner. It's really sensitive. Five is over here. I'm not sure what happened to four. <laughs> it's, we're not stuck on it. Yeah, four is missing. I apologize for that. It's the one I didn't show you. Um, the other thing that we, we shared with the CAG is some discussion about funding. You know, what are the potential funding sources? How do we go about funding this? Obviously, it's not all coming from the sewer fund. That's inappropriate. Uh, it's, it's, you know, a portion of it is because it's the sewer fund project. Uh, but obviously, the majority of it is not going to be from the sewer fund. As you all know, the general fund is is um, highly sought after, the most desirable of the funds because they can be spent in, in a variety of ways, but they're also the ones which are most limited. Uh, and so we look at a variety of funding sources. Each phase will likely have a different combination of funding sources. We will take full advantage of all grant opportunities uh, that, that we can find that are available to us, uh, mixing and matching as we need uh, to put together the pieces of the projects as we go through. It's also possible, of course, that different pieces inside of phase three will take place at slightly different times with different funding sources for each of those pieces. Um, a different way to think about funding, uh, city funding, collaborating with other groups, where are other possible sources of funds and, and other funding ideas. These are just things that, that uh, we were sharing with the community advisory group to show that uh, there is more than one way to get to the final product in terms of paying for things. Next steps, as I said, tomorrow we brief the council. Pretty much the same thing boiled down a little bit differently uh, at their workshop and then uh, on to the June 7th meeting with the final document itself. There is actually a plan that will be coming out to the CAG members when we, when we get ready to release it to the council um, that encapsulates this entire process. Uh, so there is actually a, a master plan document. Which one of those phases, Steve, does the, are we going to do new public restrooms, that, that type of thing? Each of the them park? have some, but one of the thoughts right now is um, it, it may be beneficial for us 
to uh, do the public restrooms all at one time if we can. Uh, we've had some interest at the council level in something known as a Portland Lou, uh, which is a, a, a different type of public restroom. Um, they accommodate one person. Uh, they have um, enough privacy so that you can use the restroom, but not so much privacy that you can have more than one person in there. It's not a place where you're gonna wanna sleep. It's not a place where you're gonna wanna spend the night, that kind of thing. Um, they are self-contained. They are practically indestructible. Um, and they, in a sense, uh, they come basically fully assembled and you, you plug it onto your sewer connection and your water connection. Uh, think the old Photoshop, uh, Photostop places used to be in the parking lots. It's kind of yeah. like that, except it's a restroom. And secondly, has thought been given to maintaining once we get this project? Absolutely. Solution? A lot of conversation about maintenance, a lot of concern from the community to make sure that, that what we build, we can continue to keep as nice as it was the day that, it, that we opened it. Um, and so as we go through each successive phase, there will be fine tuning to the, to the concepts and the designs until we get to the construction phase. And that will be with an eye towards how will we take care of it. Thank you. That's it from the staff on this one. So the $630,000 per acre, mm -hmm. does that include archeology span and um, the trees and uh, is the, what, how inclusive is that 630? It's very inclusive. Okay. It's, it's what we know as, again, as a planning level estimate. Okay. So, so those are pretty big, they're generous numbers. Okay. It also includes a 30% contingency. Okay. Okay. All right. And so as we move forward um, with each phase, we would expect that number obviously to be refined as well. Okay. So, but that's really just to give you a benchmark, right? Because right. people wanted to, well, how much is it going to cost? Can we afford to do this? Um, right. Is it going to be another cool design that we come up with that's just going to sit around for a long time? And we want to demonstrate that it's, it's not out of whack with what's happening in the rest of the world. Right. Um, and that it's a very attainable number. Okay. And then last, two weeks ago, I asked about the $750,000 bathroom. Mm -hmm. If we do the Portland Lou, are those off the table? The um, Portland Lou's are relatively expensive, but when we factor in that they come pre-designed, so we don't have the design cost, mm -hmm. when we factor in that we don't, uh, that they're really hard to uh, damage, we right. won't have the replacement costs, um, and we'll save money on other types of costs associated with the use of the restroom. So um, it won't be that big number, Mm -hmm. but it'll still be a relatively large number, depending but, on how many we might purchase. Correct, but we yeah. would replace the, that original idea with the Portland. If that's the direction the if council want, wants to go. If that's what yeah. they want to do. Yeah. So it would be either or not both. Or maybe it com could be a combination. I mean, if, okay. if we decide that there's a, a restroom building which still serves the need of the park, then you would do that. Right. But there are some benefits to this Portland Lou idea. Yeah, in fact, I mean, uh, Councilman Cervadia specifically asked for staff for a council briefing on that, mm -hmm. and we're preparing that briefing right now. I think within the next month, we'll be getting back to them. So we see that dovetailing with this conversation, right? Um, and then potentially even advancing the time in which we would install those if that's what the council chooses. And so does that, because I'm not familiar with the Portland Lou, <laughs> does, that, does that mean we have the ability to put a few here and a few here and make it maybe easier access for people is that yeah that's that's the idea that would be part of the idea um it, it's we think it's an economical although not cheap way to to serve that need of the community cool so you might put some uh there's you know one near pioneer way right we don't have one on pioneer way near the park that was something that was discussed during this process mm -hmm. put it at appropriate location along the trail mm -hmm. um, somewhere near the clean water facility itself because of the of the events and those things that be taking place. So strategically placing them within the park. Cool, thank you. Is Bayshore Drive completely off the plan? It is as far as we're concerned. <laughs> is it completely what? Off the plan. Off the plan. Can't, can't it, imagine. It, yeah, it is not oh, part okay. of the transportation plan. 
uh, and so it is not plan. part of our Windjammer Park uh, design. Uh, it is not part of the design. So the, the park will actually go up to the city's property line there at the drain. It's uh, along the fence with the private property. Just like it does today, yeah. Okay. Thank you for your time. Okay. Thank you. Well, with that, I guess we will call the meeting adjourned. <laughs>